All right, welcome. Tonight, Ag Arts is delighted to sponsor Sander Katz. Ag Arts was the brainchild of Fred Kirscherman from the Leopold Center, and it began about five years ago in his living room with about 30 people in attendance in a potluck dinner. We came together to explore the intersection of arts and agriculture and found Iowa State the perfect place to do this. Since then, the group has been very active, sponsoring plays, dances, exhibits, lectures, and panels, and books discussion groups. Ag Arts is now an official student organization, but it draws an audience from not only students, but faculty and staff across campus and members of the community. And during the last year, there's been a momentum to make Ag Arts a national organization. Artists, galleries, and farm ag organizations from around the U.S. are all coalescing around the Ag Arts energy. So stay tuned and sign up if you'd like to be on our newsletter mailing list. There's going to be a, a pad for email addresses, names and email addresses at the book table. Buy a book, buy a Sandra Katz book, and then sign our list. That's the, no, sign our list and buy a, well, any order. So Sander Katz, or Sander Kraut, as he is affectionately known, is himself a ball of energy, the epitome of a cool guy. He's a great food writer and book artist, an ag arts fermentation guru of the world with his book Wild Fermentation, now a classic in the culinary field. His latest book is The Art of Fermentation, the most comprehensive guide to do-it-yourself fermentation ever published. And he has just won, this is a big deal, the James Beard Award. Yay. He has given, yeah. <laughs> he has given workshops and talks all around the world, and we're lucky to have him at a workshop at ISU tomorrow. The workshop is full, but you can come anyway and, and be on standby, so to speak. Um, and you need to talk to our president, Chris, uh, and uh, he's down here in the front row, and he'll tell you where to go. Katz will also be giving another workshop at the Practical Farmers Conference of Iowa on Friday at the Sheeman Building. We thank our sponsors who have joined in with us tonight, Food and Human Nutrition, the Culinary Science Club, Practical Farmers of Iowa, Sustainable Agriculture Student Association, and Committee on Lectures. And we thank Sander Katz for traveling to us in the cold. Let's give him a very warm welcome. All right, look at this crowd. Okay, so can y'all can y'all hear me okay? Even in the back? Great. Okay, so first I just want to do a little uh, uh, informal poll and um, uh, uh, get a sense of how many of you think that you have eaten some kind of fermented food or drunk some sort of a fermented beverage in the course of this day. Okay, so that's, all, that's a lot of you, but, but, but I'll actually bet that more of you have had fermented foods and beverages today than realize that you've had fermented foods and beverages. And, um, uh, you know, uh, fermentation is so, um, um, you know, sort of thoroughly um, um, uh, a part of, of, of all of our food traditions that, that, that the people just, you know, eat products of fermentation, drink products of fermentation, and have no idea that they're doing so. So, um, so, so those of you like myself who um, uh, start off your day with a cup of coffee, coffee is fermented, and many people have no idea of that. Um, all bread is fermented, cheese is fermented, um, you know, all of the um, uh, cured meats that people make sandwiches out of are, are, are fermented. All of the condiments that people put on those sandwiches, um, if they're not fermented themselves, they involve vinegar, which is a, a product of fermentation. So, so really, you know, most people in most parts of the world, uh, you know, actually consume products of fermentation every day. Um, and according to you know one scholar's uh, estimate, one third of all food that human beings put into our mouths uh, has been transformed by fermentation before we eat it. 
So what I want to do is just sort of, you know, start by addressing the question, what is fermentation anyway? And then just try to talk about, you know, why it's important and, and, and the ways in which it transforms food. So broadly speaking, fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms. Um, now, you know, those of you who have a biology background might already be shaking your heads. Um, you know, for a biologist, fermentation means something much more specific than that. Uh, for a biologist, fermentation um, uh, means anaerobic metabolism, the production of energy without oxygen. Um, and, you know, in this sense, actually, the cells of our bodies are capable of, 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 of fermentation. Um, and, you know, most of the foods and beverages that are fermented are the products of anaerobic processes and, and would meet the biologist's definition of, of, of fermentation. So, you know, the production of alcohol from grapes or from honey or from barley or from, you know, any other carbohydrate-rich substance um, is an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. The production of yogurt from, uh, from milk is an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. The production of sauerkraut from cabbage uh, is an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. But there are a handful of uh, microbially transformed foods and beverages that are what I call the oxymoronic ferments uh, that actually do require oxygen. Um, so some examples of that would be kombucha, vinegar, tempeh, certain kinds of cheeses. So I, I just prefer to work with this broader lay definition of, uh, of fermentation, that it's the transformative action of microorganisms. But of course, not every transformative action of microorganisms results in something delicious that we want to put into our mouths. And in fact, most of the food that we discard, the food that we would call rotten or spoiled, you know, we are rejecting it precisely because of the transformative action of microorganisms. And we don't call the food that we discard fermented. Um, usually we reserve this word to describe intentional or desirable microbial transformations of our food. Um, you know, but the fact that we throw away so much food maybe gives us a little bit of insight into the inevitability of microbial transformation of our food. You know, all the things that make up our food, all of the plants, all of the animals, all of the animal products are populated by microorganisms. And, um, you know, if you eat these foods when they are very fresh, then the microorganisms don't have much of a chance to transform them. But as, as time goes on, the microorganisms transform the food. And there's a certain inevitability to microbial transformation of our food. And I think that this is why, um, you know, in culinary traditions in every part of the world, people, you know, learned how to work with this, you know, um, invisible force that, that's part of our food. And so, you know, millennia before we had microscopes and the, the ability to identify and distinguish between different kinds of microorganisms, um, you know, people learned a, a huge amount about how to, um, uh, you know, sort of guide the, the, the microbial transformation of food really by manipulating environmental conditions. And I would say that the, the practice of fermentation, um, you know, amounts to um, manipulations of environmental conditions so as to encourage the growth of certain types of organisms while simultaneously discouraging the growth of other types of, of organisms. And, um, you know, I, I certainly don't have, um, you know, comprehensive knowledge of every culinary tradition around the world, um, but I've been looking for about 15 years uh, for a counterexample for a culinary tradition that does not incorporate any kind of fermentation, and I haven't been able to find any. Um, and I, I mean, I think it would certainly be possible to, you know, be a hunter-gatherer without fermentation and spend each day procuring the food resources that are going to get you through that day. But once you, you know, get involved in, um, you know, putting away food resources from today to eat tomorrow or next week or next month or next year, you're inevitably getting into, um, um, you know, the possibility of microbial transformations of our food and the, the need to, you know, guide it in some way.
So, you know, I mean, the really miraculous thing is that, you know, people figure, I mean, all of the fermentation uh, processes that, that, that we know are, are ancient. They're, they're prehistoric. People have been practicing them for longer than we've been, you know, writing words on, on, on paper. We really don't know the origins of, 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 of any fermented foods or beverages, although there's been a huge amount of, you know, speculation about it. Um, but they're all so old um, as to sort of, you know, elude uh, um, uh, history, and, and, and we don't really know the, the origins of them. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit about some of the ways in which fermentation transforms foods. Um, so, okay, I mean, I I'll guess I'll just start by talking about alcohol. And, you know, we could talk about wine as a, a, a way of preserving grape juice, and, and it is, but, but wine is more than preserving grape juice. And, um, you know, everyone agrees that alcoholic beverages are, um, you know, the, the most ancient form of intentional fermentation uh, 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 that's been practiced. And, um, uh, you know, every kind of carbohydrate that, um, uh, you know, humanity produces has been turned into alcoholic beverages. I mean, in Central Asia, they make alcoholic beverages out of milk. Um, uh, so, so we'll, we'll, we'll put alcohol uh, aside and talk about you know sort of um, uh, uh, some of the. Um, you know, let's say more, 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 more practical. I mean, you know, the, the production of alcohol. I guess we we could call it. You know, uh, you know, there, there's a spiritual component to it. There's been a, you know, a huge amount of ritual and ceremony organized around uh, uh, the the production and the consumption of alcoholic beverages. But we'll we'll put that aside for now and and, and focus on, um, you know, maybe some of the more um, uh, utilitarian benefits of fermentation. Um, so, you know, prime among them is is preservation. And you know, for us in the 21st century, we have a you know somewhat distorted um, uh, uh, notions of food preservation because we've all you know we've all grown up with refrigeration, with freezing, um, canning. You know, we even think of canning as an old-time method of food preservation. When you know, canning is almost exactly 200 years old. It was invented um, uh, you know in, in France. I believe the year was 1809. Uh, in France, they call uh, they call canning apertization because the the who invented the process, Nicolas Apert, uh, you know, is, is, is a national hero in France. Um, so, so canning is relatively new in the scheme of things too. So if you took away your freezer and your refrigerator, um, you know, and the ability to heat process food and, and, and can it, you know, there are limited means of food preservation uh, 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 that existed 200 years ago. Um, and fermentation is a very important one. And so, you know, a food like sauerkraut, you know, actually has been a, a critical survival food in many, uh, in many temperate regions. And, and, and vegetables are not the only food that can be preserved by, by fermentation. I mean, really, you know, cheese could be thought of as a form of preserved milk. And, you know, we're used to putting cheese in the refrigerator because we have it. Um, but if, you know, if we were living without refrigeration, you know, a block of cheddar cheese, any kind of hard cheese is the kind of food you could live off of for a while without refrigeration. Um, you know, also, you know, meat. It's hard for us to even to conceive of how, you know, what you would do with meat if you didn't have a refrigerator and a freezer. Well, um, you know, the, the restaurant where we just ate, uh, I was staring at, you know, all of these um, uh, salamis and hams hanging in, uh, 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 hanging at the counter from, uh, you know, from, from strings just in the air in the ambient temperature of, of, of the restaurant. So that's only possible, you know, through fermentation. So, 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 so fermentation and specifically, um, you know, the production of, uh, of, of, of acids um, uh, uh, has been a really critical means of um, preserving food. Um, and, uh, and in many, many regions of the world, I mean, it just would be impossible for humans to have settled those regions without fermentation, and, and it remains critical in, in, in many, many parts of the world. I mean, for instance, in, in far northern places, in, you know, in, in the Arctic Circle, um, you know, people survive by, you know, 
hoarding fish in the summertime when the waterways are accessible and mounding them in, in these huge mounds where, you know, they ferment when the, when the temperatures are warm and they freeze when the temperatures are cold, but, but that's the survival food that gets people through, through the winter. So, so, you know, this aspect of fermentation, the ability of, of, of fermentation to help preserve food has just been, you know, critically uh, uh, important for, for survival in, in many, many different places. Um, I wish I could tell you that I got interested in, in fermentation uh, for such practical reasons, and at a certain level I did because I really started practicing fermentation when I started keeping a garden and realized that all the cabbage is ready at the same time, um, and um, you know was trying to figure out what to do with it and decided I should learn how to make sauerkraut. Um, but really what first got me interested in fermentation was the flavor of fermentation, and I think you know, we, we, we have to recognize um, you know, the development of uh, compelling flavor flavors as, a, as, as an important benefit of, of, of fermentation. If you walk into a gourmet food store anywhere and look around and think about the nature of the foods that we elevate on this pedestal, they're almost all products of fermentation. Um, you have your cured meats, you have your cheeses, you have your olives, you have your other kinds of pickles, you have chocolate, you have coffee, you have vanilla, um, uh, you have condiments. You know, condiments are all, you know, either they're directly fermented, like fish sauce and soy sauce, or else they use vinegar as their stabilizing force, as in, um, you know, ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, uh, chutneys, salsas. Um, um, uh, et, et cetera. So, so fermentation creates strong flavors, but they're not flavors that everybody loves. I mean, they're really, um, they're acquired tastes. And so, I, I mean, I think that, I think cheese illustrates this really, really well. So, um, you know, I'll bet in this room of people who are self-selected to come and, you know, uh, uh, talk about fermentation, um, there's probably a, you know, a sizable minority of us who would identify with the statement, like, the further away I can smell a cheese, the more excited I am to eat it. Um, does anyone else in this room share share that kind of a view with me? I see one guy in the back. Okay, so so you know maybe like I don't know two or three percent of us. So um, so you know, fermentation creates strong flavors, and they're not necessarily flavors that are that are universally accessible. They are they are examples of um, acquired uh, tastes, and um, and and they can be very compelling. I mean. Uh, you know, if, if we if we think of um, if, if we think of a spectrum of you know where where fresh food is at one end of it and rotten food, spoiled food is at the other end of it, and we really start teaching children from a very young age, you know, what's appropriate to put in your mouth, what's not, and fresh food is good, rotten food is bad. But the really interesting thing about fermented foods and you know all of these. Um, you know, delicacies that fill the shelves of gourmet food stores is that they are neither fresh nor rotten. And, and fermentation is sort of, you know, working in this creative space between fresh and, and, and rotten. And it's in this creative space that really the, 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 the highest delicacies in most culinary traditions uh, uh, fall. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, it, I mean, there's a, sometimes people want to know, like, like how do you, where, where is the line between food that is fermented to perfection and food that is rotten? And, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that, that, that you know, all, that, 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 that it's entirely culturally subjective, but it is largely culturally su subjective. And, um, you know, t for people from, from parts of the world where cheese is unknown, the cheese doesn't have to be really, really stinky to, you know, sort of make people feel afraid of it. Um, um, you know, to, 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 to many people from parts of the world where cheese is not commonly eaten, any kind of cheese just seems like rotten milk. Um, and, and yet to, to those of us who have grown up around it and learned to love it, you know, like there's nothing like it. Like we, 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 we totally love it. And, and, and all around the world there are examples like this, like the, you know, fermented fish of, of the Arctic. You know, I, I've, I've heard many stories of people who've traveled to that part of the world and couldn't bring themselves to eat it. And yet, and then they watch like, you know, some small child, you know, just chowing down on, on, on this, um, you know, uh, fermented fish. Um, so anyway, fermentation creates strong flavors which can be compelling or can be um, uh, repellent. Um, what's getting many people interested in fermentation at the present moment is um, uh, 
perceived health benefits. So I want to talk a little bit about how fermentation transforms foods nutritionally. And it's really hard to generalize. I mean, you know, if, um, you know, if coffee is fermented and sauerkraut is fermented and cheese is fermented and bread is fermented, like those foods do not share, you know, the same nutritional qualities. So, so it, it's pretty hard to generalize about, about fermentation. But fermentation does transform foods in, you know, sort of a few broad ways. And I, and I, and I want to just sort of discuss those briefly. And I'm going to try to keep this whole thing pretty brief so that we can, you know, have, have some... Um, questions and answers and, and, and interactive time. So, um, so I'd say that there's four you know, broad ways in which ferment, the process of fermentation transforms foods nutritionally. Number one, I'll call pre-digestion. This is the idea that you know, while the food is fermenting, what's actually happening is that the microorganisms are digesting nutrients in the food. And in the case of certain um, you know, dense compound nutrients that can be difficult for us to digest, the fermentation breaks those, uh, those nutrients down into simpler forms that it's frequently easier for our bodies to assimilate. Um, I think that the most vivid illustration of this would be soybeans. Um, you know, the whole reason why, you know, the vegetarian subcultures of the West adopted soybeans as an almost singular replacement for meat and milk is that it's considered to be the plant food with the most concentrated protein. And yet you never hear about people, you know, soaking soybeans, you know, cooking them until they're soft and then sitting down with a bowl of soybeans for dinner. Um, and the reason you don't hear about doing that is that they are utterly indigestible. Um, you know, they'll just, they'll just give you painful gas and indigestion, and you certainly won't be able to get the protein out of the soybeans. And so, you know, the Asian cultures that pioneered soy agriculture developed all of these different ways of fermenting the soybeans. Um, and some ways of processing the soybeans that don't involve fermentation. But, but some of the soy ferments would be soy sauce, uh, miso, tempeh, natto. If you're familiar with these foods, they're really very different from one another in flavor, in texture, in fermentation organisms, uh, in the length of fermentation. But what they all have in common is that that soy protein gets broken down into amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. And so, um, so this is an illustration of, of, of pre-digestion, breaking down some, some dense nutrient that can be difficult for us to, to digest so the, organ, so the microorganisms are doing it for us. Um, similarly, lactose, which so many people have a hard time digesting, gets broken down by fermentation. Even gluten uh, gets broken down not by a pure yeast fermentation, but by a bacterial fermentation that happens in a, uh, a, a mixed culture, uh, like a, a sourdough or a natural leavening. Uh, uh, rather than um, uh, out, out of pure yeast. So, so that's pre-digestion. Then, um, then the second, the second uh, pattern of, of transformation would be detoxification. And this really is pre-digestion also, except instead of pre-digestion of nutritious compounds, it's pre-digestion of toxic compounds and breaking down toxic compounds into benign forms. And certain food toxins are very dramatic, like cyanide found in cassava grown in certain soils. Um, and, 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 and you know, people, you know, it would be poisonous if people tried to eat those, those cassava roots without, without fermenting them. And a, a, a short, easy fermentation that's basically chopping up the roots and soaking them in water um, breaks down those cyanide compounds into benign forms and renders the cassava uh, safe to eat. And, and, you know, that's really where about a billion people on this earth get their daily calories is from, uh, is, is, is from cassava. So it's, a, so it's a really important food that's made edible in many places by fermentation. You know, certain toxins aren't quite so dramatic. Oxalic acid gets broken down by fermentation. Uh, phytic acid found in the outer layers of, of seeds gets broken down by fermentation. Um, our fermentation's even been used as a strategy for making uh, a water that we would now understand to be uh, a, a bacterially contaminated potable by adding some fermentable sugars to the water and allowing a, 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 the fermentation of a small amount of alcohol enough to sort of kill the bacteria contaminating the water. Um, so, th so that's, that's detoxification. 
Um, then there's what I would call nutrient enhancement. And this is the idea that beyond breaking down the nutrients that are present in the food to begin with, the fermentation can contribute some additional nutrients. And almost all fermented foods have higher levels of B vitamins than the raw ingredients that you start with. And this really has to do with an accumulation of microbial bodies, living and or dead, um, uh, in the food. Um, you know, they, they accumulate B vitamins in the food. Um, and then, um, you know, there are what I call unique micronutrients that are, that are metabolic byproducts of specific organisms breaking things down. And these are really just beginning to be identified and, uh, and investigated, but a, but a few of them have been found to have, um, you know, especially um, uh, beneficial qualities for us. Um, uh, in sauerkraut and other fermented vegetables, uh, there are these uh, compounds that, that, are, that, are, that are generated that are called isothiocyanates that are regarded as anti-carcinogenic and you know, help, help prevent the kinds of mutations that can uh, develop into uh, uh, cancers. And uh, the Japanese soy ferment natto, which I just mentioned a couple of, a couple of uh, uh, moments ago, the, the, the food itself has never really gained much popularity in the West, but there, there's, a, there's a, a sort of an extract from it that has, has become very widely used and is available in um, uh, like vitamin supplement stores, um, you know, everywhere in, in, in the U.S. Um, and that comp compound is usually um, uh, marketed as natto kinase. And it's been found to uh, help regulate blood clotting. And, and so a lot of people who are at risk for um, aneurysms and other kinds of clotting disorders are taking natto natokinase. And it's also been found to um, uh, dissolve the, um, uh, uh, the fibers that can accumulate in blood vessels that constrict them. So, you know, arteriosclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, other disease product, uh, processes that involve, uh, you know, the accumulation of material on the inside of, of, of blood vessels. So, so, you know, these are some examples of these um, unique micronutrients found in specific fermented foods and that are really just beginning to be investigated. And I would imagine that 10 years from now we'll know the names of, of, of more of such, uh, such compounds. Then finally, there's the live bacteria themselves. All these other things, the pre-digestion, the detoxification, the, um, the nutritional uh, uh, enhancement, you know, that, that remains with the food whether you cook it or not. But the live bacteria are really only viable uh, in fermented foods that have not been cooked or heat processed after their fermentation. Um, and, um, you know, in the scheme of things, historically, like nobody ever had to, th I mean, people didn't know about bacteria, but they, they didn't need to think about, you know, replenishing and diversifying bacteria. But because, you know, in the period since we've known about bacteria, we've mostly been taught to fear bacteria. Um, and we've, uh, you know, our whole culture has gotten caught up in a project that I call the war on bacteria. And it's this sort of, you know, ideology that bacteria are bad, bacteria should be avoided, bacteria should be killed, bacteria should be eradicated. Um, and we have just all been thoroughly indoctrinated in this idea for our entire lives. Um, and, you know, just in the last decade or so, I, I would say we're beginning to get a more nuanced view. Um, you know, 10 years ago, biologists came up with the statistic that the cells of our bodies, the cells that, that reflect our unique individual DNA code are actually outnumbered 10 to 1 by bacteria that we're host to. Um, and these bacteria are not, you know, parasites, they're not freeloaders, they turn out to give us a huge amount of our functionality. You know, we couldn't effectively digest food or assimilate nutrients without bacteria in our intestines. Bacteria in our intestines also th synthesize certain essential nutrients so that we don't have to find them in our food. Um, what we call our immune function is largely regulated by bacteria. Um, and just in the last year or so, there's been some exciting research uh, uh, that suggests that serotonin and other you know, chemicals that, that you know, determine how we think and, ha and how we feel are regulated by, by gut bacteria. So on the one hand, there's this like ideology that we all, you know, have been indoctrinated with our entire lives that bacteria are so terrible 
Um, and, you know, based on this ideology, there's all this marketing, you know, look at soaps in the supermarket and, and you know, there's nothing more alluring that you can write on a package of soap than that it kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria. And, you know, consumers respond to this because we've all been taught that bacteria are so terrible. And if, you know, if soap is important, then soap with, with chemicals that kill bacteria must be even better. Um, so, so in, in addition to the war on bacteria being, uh, you know, sort of an, an, an ideological indoctrination, it's also a form of chemical warfare. And so, you know, there's antibiotic drugs, there's antibacterial cleansing products, there's the chlorine that we put into all of our water to kill bacteria that continues to have some residual effect in, in our bodies. So historically, nobody ever had to think about, uh, about, you know, replenishing or diversifying bacteria in their gut. But in the 21st century, when we're, you know, constantly exposed to these chemical compounds that kill bacteria, it's actually become rather important for us to, you know, consciously think about replenishing and diversifying bacterial populations. One way people do this is with little capsules um, called probiotics, and each probiotic manufacturer will tell you that, you know, they have the strain or the combination of strains that, you know, is, is, is really going to, you know, keep you healthy or improve your health. And, you know, there's a huge body of, you know, clinical trial research, um, you know, documenting the, the effectiveness of these different probiotic agents. And for the most part, people in the probiotics industry would scoff at the idea that traditional bacterially rich foods um, you know are probiotic and 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 really there's comparatively little research you know nobody owns sauerkraut nobody's investing money in clinical trials for sauerkraut because the benefit of that kind of research wouldn't really accrue to anyone in particular um, you know, and, and you know, we're, we're, we're living in a time when, you know, most research is, you know, sort of funded by someone who, who stands to, to benefit from, from, from that research. But there, there is a small body of research and, um, uh, you know, I mean, actually a lot of it suggests that, you know, traditional foods with, which, which um, incorporate, you know, broad communities of bacteria actually have, um, you know, much more powerfully immune stimulating effects than any, you know, probiotic capsule with just a couple of strains. Um, uh, you know, in, in, in the realm of, um, you know, bacterial stimulation, really diversity is its own reward. And one of the fascinating things that, that I've been learning about bacteria, and, you know, my disclaimer here is I am not a biologist. I am not a microbiologist. I, I, I'm, I am, you know, a, a lay person who's interested in food, who, you know, got obsessed with fermentation, and as a result has ended up reading a lot about bacteria. But the really fascinating thing about bacteria is that they are not genetically stable. They are inherently genetically flexible. Bacteria can um, uh, pick up genes from the environment, they can exchange genes with one another, they can release genes that are, that are redundant for them or, or unnecessary given their environment. And so bacteria are shapeshifters, they're, they're constantly uh, 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 changing. And that's why, you know, even conceptually, the idea of like, you know, a capsule with, you know, 10 billion cells of one single bacterium just is not as powerful as a food that has a broad community of bacteria because the, the food with a, with, a, with, with a broad community of bacteria is introducing this broader range of genetic material into your intestines to bring greater adaptability and resilience to the microbial cells that are already there. Um, than any single strain could. But anyway, I, I would say that, that, the, that the probiotic benefit, the live culture benefit of, of certain fermented foods uh, is really the most profound nutritional benefit uh, of them. And, but you need to be informed. I mean, not every fermented food has, has live culture. You know, if you want to eat raw sourdough dough, that has live cultures. But nobody really wants to eat raw dough. Once you put it in the hot oven, those, those um, live cultures, um, you know, are, are killed by heat. Which is not to say that bread is bad. It's just to illustrate that, like, certain foods lend themselves to live culture uh, consumption and, and other kinds of foods um, uh, don't. Um, you know, the sauerkraut in the supermarket in a can doesn't have the live bacteria uh, uh, intact. Um, you know, there are 
um, uh, you know, in increasingly you can find, um, uh, you know, sort of smaller local brands of sauerkraut that, that, that are typically sold in a refrigerated section that do have live cultures intact. Or really most of what I do is just showing people how easy it is to do. And, and you know, usually in my public speaking I have a cabbage and a cutting board in front of me and I'm, you know, showing people how to make sauerkraut, which is what I'll be doing tomorrow. Um, but, but really, like, the thrust of my work is, is you know, just showing people how easy this is. I mean, all of these fermented foods, like, people have been making for thousands of years. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, in, in really just a few generations, these, you know, sort of foods which had been part of, you know, most households and, and every community have largely disappeared behind fact, I mean, the foods themselves haven't disappeared, but their production has disappeared from the fabric of our lives. And the, um, you know, the, the, the simple techniques for their production, which, which always had just been, you know, part of what everybody had to learn to get by, have, you know, the, 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 the thread of continuity passing them down through the generations, uh, you know, has, 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 been, has been severed at the same time as we all became afraid of bacteria. So in teaching people how to make sauerkraut, which is like so simple, you know, chop, salt, pound, stuff it in a jar. Like that's all it is. Um, I mean, it's, it's really, really easy, but people project a huge amount of fear onto this. Like the number one question that I have encountered is, you know, how do I know I'm going to get good bacteria growing rather than bad bacteria? You know, I don't have a microscope. Even if I did, I wouldn't be able to tell whether it was a good bacteria or a bad bacteria growing. Um, you know, in fact, sauerkraut is among the safest foods known to humans. Statistically speaking, sauerkraut is safer than raw vegetables. And, uh, you know, even though every year we hear about people getting sick from raw vegetables, I hope nobody is paralyzed by that fear and not eating vegetables um, because a few people get sick every year. And, and, you know, even if your vegetables had been contaminated in some way, once you chop them up and salt them and create the conditions where the lactic acid bacteria, which are part of all plants, can proliferate, that would, you know, as, it, as the environment acidifies, it, it would wipe out the contaminating bacteria. So, I mean, according to the USDA, there has never been a single documented case of food poisoning from fermented vegetables in the United States. Um, and, and also, you know, from this particular researcher who, who, has, who has said that, he's also looked internationally and can't find any examples internationally either. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's incredibly safe and just in general fermentation, you know, has been used as a very effective strategy for food safety. Um, Okay, I, I, want, I, want, I guess I'll, I'll wrap up my sort of my, my remarks by um, uh, 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 just talking for a moment about another connotation of the word fermentation. So the word fermentation comes from Latin fervere, which means to boil. And it's because the visible action of fermentation in liquids is bubbles, just like the visible action of boiling in liquids. And the word yeast has a very similar root. Yeast comes from Greek zestos, which means to boil. And so, um, you know, and, and until microbiology, until Louis Pasteur's work and, and, and microbiology, you know, having an analysis of what's really going on, um, um, you know, with, with bacteria and other microorganisms in fermentation, fermentation was recognized from, from the visible action, from, from the bubbles. But there also uh, uh, developed this metaphorical understanding of fermentation. So, you know, people talk about cultural ferment, political ferment, intellectual ferment, social ferment, spiritual ferment. And, all, you know, all of these forms of fermentation, you know, have to do with, with bubbliness, except instead of, you know, it happening from the work of, of, of microorganisms, um, you know, in, in liquids, it has to do with people getting bubbly. When people are excited about things, you know, they, they, they become irrepressible and, and excited and they want to share their excitement. And, and so, you know, I, I guess I want to just sort of close my remarks by, by pointing out that, that in addition to being a mode, uh, an important mode of transformation of, 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 of foods and beverages, um, fermentation is also an important mode of social transformation and, and, and of social change. 
Um, so with that, I will open it up and, um, you know, really the, the, the questions can be, you know, about the mold and your sauerkraut or, you know, why your beer stopped bubbling, you know, or they can be about, you know, sort of, you know, bigger, more philosophical questions, but, but, but anything. And are there some microphones around her? Okay, so, so. All right, you're well positioned. Uh, all right. Hi. Um, I have a question specifically about sauerkraut. So we've we've been making it for several years, and we have a large six-gallon crock, and it's been pretty inconsistent. And I'm wondering if you might know why. What we what we found is that we buy sauerkraut around or the cabbage around St. Patrick's Day when cabbage is really cheap. We go through the steps, you know, chop it up as fine as we can, salt, etc. And it turns out great. But we also grow cabbage in the garden. And we find that consistently, instead of fermenting, it rots when we do the same process. And I'm wondering if you might know why. Hmm. Well, okay, so I have a couple questions. So, are, are, well, like, are, you, are you getting liquid rising over the top in both cases? Um, in neither case, we have enough liquid. In both, both cases, we've had to add brine to the mixture to get it to cover the top. Okay, well, I mean, that's the most important, uh, you know, that, that's the most important thing of all is making sure your vegetables are, 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 are under liquid. So, you know, I'm sure we've all had leftover vegetables that sat on our counter and were exposed to air and just started growing mold on top of them. Like a head of cabbage will never turn itself into sauerkraut. Exposed to air, mold is what will grow. And so, you know, when I talked to the beginning about how, all, you know, all fermentation processes are, you know, are, 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 are essentially manipulating environmental conditions and sauerkraut, that's the manipulation is you're protecting the vegetables from air by getting them under a brine. There's always enough water in the cabbage unless it's very old. You have to do a little bit of work to get it, to get it out. So that, that's where this sort of, you know, in, 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 in sort of, you know, uh, um, community production, um, uh, you know, in, in Northern Europe, typically they, they, you know, they'd be making it in a barrel and they'd have some kind of a big, you know, pounding tool that they would smash it with. Or in some places, I mean, I've heard this story from, I'll bet, 20 people, uh, people older than me who grew up in places in Central or Northern Europe. Um, and um, as little kids, they had their feet scrubbed, and they put them inside the barrel, and they had the kids jumping up and down um, uh, you know, on the vegetables to smash them. Um, in small household production, I think just using your hands in a bowl and squeezing them like this. But, but whether you're pounding or jumping up and down on them or squeezing them, you're doing the same thing. You're bruising the vegetables, breaking down cell walls, and the cells are releasing their, 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 their water. Um, you know, if you're using older cabbage or, you know, you have arthritis or carpal tunnel syndrome or for whatever reason you can't, you can't do that, you can totally add water. Um, and that, that, that's a perfectly fine thing to do. But, um, so, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to sort of diagnose specific problems without actually seeing it and smelling it. I mean, the, the, the most common problems that people have um, in fermenting vegetables is, you know, you do all this work to get the vegetables submerged under liquid, that protects them from oxygen, but there's always an edge where it meets the oxygen, and that's where people have problems. Molds can grow there, yeast can grow there. There's all sorts of different um, uh, 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 elegantly designed crocks that are, that, that, that are designed to exclude air so you can avoid that problem. Um, but, but that's usually where the rotting starts, is from the top um, uh, with, with, with these aerobic growths. And if those go unchecked, if you don't skim that off, then, then you know, the, the mycelium from those molds can penetrate really deeply into your vessel and begin to degrade the texture and the flavor um, uh, uh, of the whole batch. So you want to try to avoid molds. Um, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll bet that the problematic batches are happening in warmer weather, like maybe you're making it in summertime. Okay, well, I mean, 70 is a little, you know, I mean, you can make sa sauerkraut, is v you can make it in any, in any temperature range, but the warmer it is, the shorter the horizon that it has. So, 
um, you know, if you're making it in a 70 degree space, it's not going to be good months later. You know, that could be, that could be great for a few weeks. Um, but, um, uh, you know, typically, like the time that people make sauerkraut is in the fall. Um, or, you know, or at least that's when they make it for long-term storage. So, you know, as temperatures are getting down and then storing it in, a, in an unheated cellar that stays, you know, under 60 degrees, you know, as close as possible to earth temperature, about 55 degrees. Um, and then, you, you know, typically it'll be great all winter long and into the next spring. Um, when sauerkraut begins to degrade, uh, okay, so there, there's a basic, like, you know, concept that, you know, all living creatures contain the enzymes to digest themselves, and a cabbage, it, cabbage is included in that. And so what, 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 makes cab what makes vegetables crunchy are pectins. In the short run, when you salt your, your vegetables, it hardens up the pectins and makes them crunchier. But then over time, there, there's a class of enzymes called pectinase enzymes that will digest those pectins. And you know, usually when sauerkraut goes bad, it's that it gets really soft. It gets like a baby food kind of a texture. And you know, for me, that's really, really unappealing. But there's a lot of cultural subjectivity to it. Like I, I once had this, um, this Austrian woman taste my six-week-old sauerkraut. And she said, oh, that's very good for coleslaw. Um, and then what I, what I learned from her is that in Austria, they like to age their sauerkraut until it starts to get soft, and that's when they think it's ripe. So at exactly the same moment that I'm thinking about putting into, into the compost, they're thinking that it's, it, that, it, that it's about ripe. So I don't know if when you say that it, it just it, it rots, it's like just getting really, you know, re really soft with a lot of like ugly growth on the top. Like from the very beginning. Um, like, what's it like after a week? Um, usually it takes a couple of weeks to get going, but it's it's apparent right away. As soon as you can start telling if the process is not working, it just doesn't work. You just know that there's something wrong. Hmm. Well, that's it. Well, I mean, you definitely want to you 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 definitely want to cover it to keep flies and things out. Um, so, so the way I, I typically work with an open crock method. I mean, there there are there are closed crock methods. There there are these uh, uh, crocks with little uh, um, uh, a water channel and the top and the and the top goes in in that and it, it prevents um, uh, it, it fills the space inside with carbon dioxide and then and then if there's pressure it sort of burps out but the lower pressure air in, outside can't get in. So you it, it's a strategy for for trying to minimize those kinds of surface surface growths. Um, uh, I don't typically use those. I typically work with an open crock method. I put a plate inside the crock that sets on the surface of the vegetables. I put a weight on top of that to bear down and force the vegetables down and the juice up. And you gotta, you gotta have a layer to keep the flies out. Like the worst thing that could have, the worst failure you can have with sauerkraut, and I've had this happen many times, um, is you can have flies land on it and lay their eggs and find maggots crawling out of it. Um, so you really want to, you, you really want to, you know, uh, uh, guard, uh, you know, j just keep flies off of it. Um, and, you know, and then it'll really, really smell rotten. But, but I, you know, I wish I wish I could like totally di diagnose it. But I'd really, I'd have to sort of see it and 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 smell it. Um, uh, you know, I think like you know, in warm temperatures, thinking about a shorter. There, there's no objective like time when it's done. I, like you know, I had the you know the Austrian woman who thought my six-week-old sauerkraut wasn't mature enough to eat, and then I've had I've served people three-day-old sauerkraut that I was embarrassed to be serving, and had them say, "Wow, that's the best sauerkraut I ever had in my life." I thought I didn't like sauerkraut, but that's delicious. So you know, one of the great things about making anything yourself, and particularly a fermented food is you can make it the way you like it. You can ferment it for a short time and have it be mild, or ferment it for a long time and have it be really, really acidic. You can make it really salty if that's what you like. You could make it barely salty at all. You could make it super spicy or not spicy at all. I mean, there's just a huge amount of variability. There's not just one way you, you can do this. So if, um, do I get more nutrient value out of sauerkraut than raw cabbage? Um, well, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get higher levels of B vitamins. You'll get the vitamin C really well preserved, but it, but it won't be preserved forever. 
Um, once the, once the, the, the most active fermentation slows down and there's no longer carbon dioxide constantly being released, you'll get a slow um, um, uh, uh, decrease in the vitamin C levels o o over time. Um, but you'll have the live cultures that weren't really present in the raw cabbage that are present in, in the fermented cabbage. I would never suggest that fermented vegetables are intrinsically better than fresh vegetables. I mean, I think it's great to eat fresh vegetables, and um, uh, you know, but I, 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 th I think that they're, they're different. And, and um, you know, historically, when people ate sauerkraut was when there weren't fresh vegetables available. And I think in our, you know, contemporary world, um, uh, it just makes sense to approach it with moderation and, uh, you know, and, and eat sauerkraut or, you know, fermented vegetables, but not necessarily in huge uh, amounts and not think of them as being instead of fresh vegetables, but as a supplement to fresh vegetables. Can I ask you two questions? Okay. Um, one of them is, um, does the, does the, do the probiotics in the fermented vegetables help people with digestive problems? And I know that's kind of a general category, digestive problems, but can that happen? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I okay. First of all, let, let me disclaimer. I am not a clinician. Um, you know, I like I, I like I'm not really um, I, 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 I don't really have the you know the training or the background to be diagnosing anyone's problems or you know recommending solutions for them. You know that said, I correspond with an incredible number of people, and I you know I've I've probably fielded you know 20,000 emails over the last 15 years from people about about fermentation and. I have he just heard a, a, a huge number of stories from people um, uh, who feel like you know they, they've had chronic um, digestive problems relieved by incorporating live culture foods into their diet. Okay. And then the second question is, uh, I've, I've looked at doing fermentation. Where I get stuck is that they say after it's slowed down, then you want to put it in the refrigerator. I have very limited refrigerator space. I don't want to buy another refrigerator. Is there another option? There are a lot of different options. Um, I mean, one option is to make small batches and never put them in the refrigerator and just, you know, make small batches and then eat them up. And as you're getting near the end of one batch, start up another batch. Um, if you have a, an unheated cellar, I mean, you know, this is a food that people ate for thousands of years before anyone heard of a refrigerator. Um, so, you know, the classic thing was to store it in an, in an unheated cellar or, um, or to bury the crock or to, uh, I mean, in pits in the ground. I mean, you know, like, like as late as World War II, there's documentation in, in Poland of communities making their sauerkraut in pits in the ground. Um, so, I mean, you know, there, there, there's a lot of possibilities, but, I, you know, I, I would say that the most straightforward one, um, you know, for someone who's just wanting a sort of a small supply of, of, of sauerkraut to supplement um, uh, uh, their diet is just to make small batches and, and just make them frequently instead of making, you know, one giant batch a year. I mean, one giant batch a year, you know, makes sense if you're a farmer and trying to put up a bunch of, a, a bunch of vegetables, but it only makes sense if you have an unheated cellar. Um, if you're living in a house that you're going to, you know, be heating to 70 degrees all winter, you know, it's just not, it's not going to last for months and months at, at, at that kind of a temperature. It'll just turn into, uh, you know, a mush. My question is about the relationship of fermentation to the four or five basic flavors that we sense. And the, the, the four or five basic? Flavors, the sweet, sour, salty, um, but particularly about how it alters our sense of whether something is sweet or not. Does fermentation um, alter or heighten or, or weaken any of those flavors? Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I would say that the, that the flavor that really is the hallmark of fermentation would be umami, the, you know, the, 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 the fifth flavor, um, you know, the, the, the savory flavor. And, um, you know, m most, most fermented foods, you know, have, very, have, have elevated levels of glutamates, um, uh, you know, and, 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 and would really exemplify the umami flavor. In terms of sweet flavor, I mean, for the most part, fermentation organisms consume sugar and turn it into, you know, acids, you know, and or alcohol.
So, you know, most ferments, you know, aren't very sweet, or at least they're less sweet than the thing that you started fermenting. Um, you know, certainly, I, I mean, I've heard of people, um, you know, talk about if they, if they eat too much sugar, sometimes, you know, like something like sauerkraut juice or eating sauerkraut might like sort of neutralize that feeling for them. Um, but, but, but in general, I mean, fermented foods, you know, tend to not be very sweet. You know, it's only if we sweeten them, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the American concept of yogurt where you, you know, put, put lots of, you know, sugar and fruit in, in, in the yogurt. But if you were to try to ferment it like that, all those sugars would ferment into acids and you would just end up with something that was super sour. So I'm interested in the live culture benefit, and I'm wondering, since I like sauerkraut, can I just stick with that, or do I need to go with a variety of foods, like they say to eat a variety of vegetables and fruit? Can I get the benefit just from sauerkraut? Well, I mean, I think you definitely get a benefit from just from sauerkraut, and the interesting thing about sauerkraut is that um, and when I say sauerkraut, it's sort of code for all all forms of fermented vegetables. But 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 they develop um, uh, uh, in a successional way, uh, uh, something like the life of a forest. So you know you start out with um, uh, uh, you sort of you know one one uh, uh, strain of lactic acid bacteria dominating the environment, and then as the pH conditions change, uh, that gives way to the rise of, of a next strain which is dominant, and so you get a series of dominant strains over the course of a, of, of a vegetable fermentation. So, you know, actually, if you're eating it at different stages of its development, you're, you're, you're getting different bacterial strains uh, uh, through, through the same food at different stages uh, of its development. So, I, I mean, you know, if, you, if sauerkraut is what you like, that, that, that's great, keep eating it. But, but I, would, I would certainly say, you know, that you get more diverse bacterial stimulation if you start incorporating incorporating, you know, uh, other kinds of vegetables and other kinds of um, uh, foods fermented in, in, into your diet. Go ahead. Sure. Hi. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that I've really been enjoying your most recent book. And I've been reading through it, and I decided to try fermenting oats with grits just because I like to make uh, porridge. Um, and uh, after about 24 hours, the flavor gets to be pretty funky. And I would call it maybe acidic, but mostly it's funky. And I was wondering if you could confirm that I'm eating something that's beneficial to me, or am I just being weird <laughs> and eating funky so, crap? So, so you're, you're, soaking the, you're soaking the oats and then cooking them? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Hours. Okay, so 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 basically, you, you know, um, I mean, a lot of the old traditions of using grains involved soaking the grains first. Um, uh, you know, if you if you look in old British uh, uh, cookbooks, the recipes for oatmeal mostly involved soaking the oats before you cook them. Um, uh, you know, in, in, in the African traditions of, of, of making porridges, generally the, the, the grains are, are, are soaked before they're, they're, they're cooked. I mean, this, this, this pre-digests the grains a little bit. It makes for a creamier porridge. You get more minerals out of the grains. But you don't get live cultures, really, because you're cooking them. Um, so, yes, you're getting more out of the grains by virtue of soaking them. But you know, I would say that you know, if you're if you're if you feel like the flavor is getting getting funky and you don't like it, you know, ferment it for you know, soak it for a shorter period of time, um, uh, so that it, you know, just soak it from the night before, and you'll get a, you'll get a lot of that pre-digestion benefit, you know, without getting the flavors that that you're finding uh, uh, to be funky. Um, and I would also just say that you know, funky is not always a bad thing. <laughs> Um, I'd like to talk about cooking more because I, I mean I like it on I like cause you can, like you said you can do all sorts of different things with uh, with, with sauerkraut you know it can be spicier and, and so it's just great on things like fish and meat but then if you cook it it's going to probably take away half the life of it so what would you suggest for what how do you manage that process in terms of preparing food 
Well, I mean, I, I just think it's important. Okay, so the, the standard American approach to sauerkraut has been you ferment it in the crock and then you pressure can it. And I, I mean, I think that that is... I think that when you do that, you're depriving yourself of the, 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 the biggest benefit of the sauerkraut, which is the live bacterial cultures. On the other hand, there's all sorts of amazing culinary traditions that involve cooking these foods. So, you know, in Korean cuisine, there's, you know, kimchi soup and kimchi pancakes. And, you know, in Russian tradition, there's like sauerkraut pierogies. And in Polish tradition, there's bigos, which is, you know, meat that's like, uh, you know, um, um, uh, marinated in sauerkraut and then sort of stewed for a long time in sauerkraut. And, you know, there's so many wonderful ways to incorporate the ferments, you know, into cooking that, I mean, I don't think that there's any reason not to, as long as you're eating a little bit of it raw. And, I mean, some ways of eating it raw are, um, you know, on sandwiches, just as a condiment, you know, along with, you know, along with your, you know, mayonnaise and mustard and ketchup and whatever you put on the sandwich, you know, putting a little bit of sauerkraut on it just blends right in. Um, you know, using it as a, just a, like a small side dish with whatever else you're eating and to mix in with your rice and potatoes and, 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 and whatever. Um, you know, having it with eggs or, or in a burrito. I mean, there's all sorts of ways to incorporate it raw into your food. And I would say as long as you eat a little bit of it raw, it's, it's, it's great to, to cook with it also. There's all sorts of, you know, wonderful ways you can use it. Um, let me just put a little shout out for sauerkraut juice and kimchi juice and pickle brine. Um, you know, you get to the end of the jar and there's some juice. You don't have to pour that down the drain. You know, pour it down this drain. Um, <laughs> You know, so like, you know, they, you know, that's an unparalleled digestive tonic is, you know, drinking a little bit of sauerkraut juice or kimchi juice. And in Russian cuisine, they make, they, they use it as a soup base, the, 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 the extra pickle brine. Um, so, you know, often it's too salty, so you just have to dilute it and, um, you know, mix it with your stock or, 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 or whatever. But it's just, you know, full of flavor, full of nutrients. Um, so, 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 yeah, I mean, uh, cook with it, but just, you know, try not to cook all of it, you know, leave, leave a little bit of it to eat raw.